When they say you haven't dealt with the loss, you never actually allowed yourself to feel the feelings. But once you do, it's like a valve, it releases. And then you were talking about breakups and we did an episode on grief. And the way that grief works in the brain and nervous system is that there are three sort of factors that are mapped in our consciousness and our subconscious. And these are space, time, and this notion of closeness, which is attachment. Space and time is very simple. It's where is the person that I love and when will I see them next? Right? I mean, if you have a relative that lives overseas and you know they're alive, you're not going to grieve them. You might really miss them, but you're not going to grieve them the same way you would if suddenly you get the note, unfortunately, that they passed away. And then attachment is how close you are to them, like how critically you rely on them for internal control and support. And that doesn't mean they have to be an immediate caregiver. It could just be like a really good friend, like a really good friend that just your knowledge of him just makes you feel good. You feel better in the world, you know, as a guy who mostly grew up with in a kind of a big pack of male friends. I mean, I feel strongest and happiest and most secure in life when I see something about one of my friends doing well in life. It just makes me feel good. If one of them dies, and unfortunately I'm getting to the age where a number of them have died, then you feel like all of a sudden like there's a loss internally, right? Okay, that's all sort of obvious. But what's interesting is that the grief process itself is about restructuring this map. This map, think of it like a tripod. It's got three pieces, space, time, and closeness. When someone dies, it's very confusing for the brain because where are they in space? Well, the body is put someplace. Maybe it's cremated, maybe it's not. We have notions of a spirit, and that depends on one's orientation, a soul or a spirit, okay? Or if you don't, then you don't. Then then where do they go, right? And then time, when will you see them again? Never. You'll never see them again. And the closeness component remains. And so there's an untethering of this map And so there's been brain imaging studies showing that if you look in the brain in people that are in grief from loss of a really strong attachment, the state of brain and body that gets flipped on is a motivational state. So grief is a motivated state to bridge the distance in time and space, and yet it's impossible. And so the process of grief is a gradual waning of that motivation and a gradual shift of the memory of the person into some concept, whether or not it's a soul, whether or not it's just the past, whether or not it's their energy. You know, again, it depends on what the forebrain of that particular person believes, shifts that concept of that person into a place where the brain is comfortable. There's no more autonomic arousal. There's no motivation. When there's a breakup, it's exceedingly hard, especially if the person is young. You know, if you look at suicides after breakups, those are far more common in younger people than they are in older people. Why? Because the relationship represents the whole future. They have no concept that they're, they know there are other people, but it sort of feels like the whole world is, is shutting down. So, In breakups, what's happened is the person is no longer available in time and space. This is why when someone breaks up, you literally have to let them go, right? You know, constant pursuing of them is out of context is not healthy. They have a name for that. It's called a stalker. Don't do it. The brain has to think that the person is gone in time and space. This has become much harder with social media, right? Because people can check up on people. They can hear from people in the old days. Like when I was growing up, you just like took the phone off the hook or you diverted your attention. Now we are constantly renewing that the person is still there. And so love and the loss of love and the death grief are virtually identical. It's that motivational state. And this is why it's so hard to not reach out to somebody that you really miss and want back. You know, how comfortable one is feeling their feelings, male or female, is going to strongly dictate how quickly one moves through grief. This is the same thing as trauma. The more willing someone is to feel the full depth and intensity of the feelings that they associate with that trauma, the more quickly they're going to move through the trauma. You know, people use a number of strategies. They use distraction. They sublimate to things like anger and avoidance of various kinds in order to not feel the traumatic feelings or not feel the breakup. People will, you know, uh, try and self-soothe with alcohol or try and self-soothe with multiple new partners or whatever it happens to be. It doesn't work. It just extends it because this map of space, time, and closeness needs to be fractured. And the only way to do that is for the brain to have to confront the reality, which is that whether by death or by breakup, they are no longer available. It's like the food on the other side of that wall is gone. It's just not there anymore. People do that post breakup. They usually do that by talking to everybody about the breakup, um, which is its own form of perseverating on the motivation. What did I do? What did I do wrong? This and that. And some of that analysis is healthy. Some of it's not. Now, why would one group be, let's just say, effective at dealing with breakups? It's probably the ability to really feel the full intensity of how sad it is and be able to confront that. So I think the better that we can lean into the emotional states that we fear the most, but in a controlled 
way where we're not harming ourselves or other people, the better. The more that we try and avoid that and we try and sublimate or just, you know, and I've done this, so I'm speaking from experience, you know, I would use the anger or the sadness from an experience to just work 10, 10 times longer, 10 times harder to just get that much more focus. You're taking that autonomic arousal, that narrow aperture and that energy, and you're putting it onto something that moves your life forward. So in some cases that's good because you still need to function. It gave me the illusion that I was working through something because you get all the accoutrements and rewards of hard work, but what you don't do is remap that space-time closeness map. And I guarantee you find yourself five or 10 years later wondering why you're so exhausted or why certain things in life aren't going well. And it's because when they say you haven't dealt with the loss, you never actually allowed yourself to feel the feelings. But once you do, it's like a valve, it releases.